Hey, get over all the nice liking you got. You got all this nice liking all over the ground and stuff. We got Sarah and Oral Repens up here. Anyway, uh, welcome to another episode of Crime Pays the Bond. It does it. Today is coming to you from lovely Liberty County, Florida, about an hour west of Tallahassee over there in the panhandle. You can see all the uh, all the longleaf pine. This is a pine plantation right here because they do the lumber. They do the lumber stuff. See, they, they cut and harvest them with the ship, but we're not trying to show you that. I do love longleaf pine, but uh, I, I don't like the uh, fragmented and almost completely absent ecology of a pine plantation. So we're going to check out some of the stuff growing on these uh, four to five million year old uh, clayey sands out here and uh, check out some of the diversity. Look, even the poison ivy, the toxicodendron has adapted to this uh, dry, sandy environment. Adapted to the sand. It's got hairs on the undersides of those leaves. Toxicodendron pubescence. All right. A rare species of poison ivy. Jesus Christ. You know, I, I got to respect it a little bit. Look, you got hairs on the stems. See that? And then there's those, uh, there's those flowers. See that? They're kind of beautiful. They're kind of beautiful. All right. Just don't touch them. All right, that Eurasiol didn't evolve for humans. It's an antifungal compound. Really, tell me what you found over there. Yeah, what's going on? Asclepias humastrata, the sandhill milkweed. This beautiful, voluptuous creature. And I can even see, it looks like some, um, oh, possibly, I thought that might be oh, a You thought that was an egg or something. Yeah, I thought that was an egg, but that's just some, um, I knocked, knocked the leaf and it's exuding some latex. Oh, it's bleeding latex. Hey, sorry I was late. I had to stop at the Liberty County Knights of Columbus and check out the trough here. <laughs> Who's this? Now you got a mint, huh? This is Conradina glabra, the Apalachicola rosemary. This is an endemic, very narrowly endemic mint to the bluffs of this area. This is the um, Apalachicola bluffs and ravines. We are in a bluff, which is an ancient sand dune. And this species occurs only in this region. So before they put the pine plantation here, this was an intact, somewhat diverse ecosystem. Very diverse. And so this is what's kind of left on the margins, you know. Yep. Same thing you get going on with the Midwest prairies. It's all been turned into agriculture for the death cult. And so now you, you get stuff left on the margins. Yeah, unfortunately. The Knights of Columbus, they got a real, they got some, they got a real nice bathroom over there in a setup. You should check it out next time you're down here. Anyway, look at that Conradina. Yeah, I should make a point too. You know, I'm not against agriculture. I just the way the Midwest done it's kind of depressing. You know that monoculture shit. Just, just depressing monocultures of corn for livestock. Anyway, look at those fucking god damn it! Look at those flowers. Again, four stamens, bilaterally symmetrical flower. Got the style coming out the top, and those opposite leaves. And look at the abaxial surface. It's white. All right, and it does smell. What does it smell like? It kind of smells like rosemary. Ah. Oh! It does, it smells minty and nice. Lily, Lily tells me this thing doesn't need the sand, okay? Like a lot of these, you know, sand endemics. All right, so we're technically dealing with edaphic endemism here. Same thing you get on gypsum or on a limestone or on serpentine. Uh, you technically don't need the sand, with this species at least. It does well on, a, it does pretty well on a, you know, in a garden setting. Why do you get species that only grow on the sand? Because the sand dunes provide a, an arid microsite, a more dry microsite, amidst the uh, the otherwise mesic and somewhat wet forest in the surrounding areas. So you get a different substrate, all right, with thinner soils with just the sand, and you get a different community of plants. Fucking wild. Real nice. But this Conradina smells incredible. They get some money shots of that. And, of course, we got our old friend Smilex Auriculata over here, too. All right, Smilex Casey. Order is Lily Ailey's, but, uh, you know... It's its own family, Smiley Casey. So it's related to lilies, but it's a vining bastard with a lot of diversity in that genus. Kind of a pain in the ass when you're walking through it. Look at this, I seen this in a nightmare. I seen you in Metroid. Remember that, that, that it was the 80s game. What are you doing? What's it, did, we, did we mess it up or is he just on no, his own? I think we didn't do that to, to him. He's going, he's probably finding a place to pupate. Christ, there's gotta be an easier way to get around than that. That is so rad. Why is he doing that? Because he's a larva. No, I know, but why, is he, why don't you why don't you get like a motility scooter or something? Is what I'm saying. I just <laughs> wow, look at that. You don't think he's gonna bite you or nothing, no, do I you? Don't I don't know much it. about them beetles he's over there. Definitely uh, the larva of some kind of very large beetle, maybe even like a Hercules beetle, because we have them out here. Why doesn't somebody try to eat them? I'm sure somebody, some bird would love to eat this. There he dude. goes. Look, Metroid. Okay, Metroid. Episode three. Did they make a sequel to it? I don't know, but this, you know, this guy. But he's. You think he's? 
he's not necessarily up to no good. He's just no, trying no. to get by. He's, just to, he's looking for a place to pupate, I'm sure. Oh, he's a good boy. Okay, he's a good boy. Well, in that case, they nasty's titties. What is he doing? What's he doing? Look, he's really... Oh, man. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Don't don't get rowdy. Don't get rowdy. Man, I don't even know how these beetle larvae make it that far. They're so plump and juicy. They gotta get picked off so easily. It's probably why you, you don't see too many of them. Oh, look at that beautiful panhandle sky. Oh, that's nice. You know, my, my legs are freaking covered in so many chigger bites, okay? I'm, I'm doing everything. I got permethrin, I'm doing a, the picaridin, I'm doing deed, I'm doing all the hippie essential oils. I mean, anything. All right, I'll, I'll huff that stuff. I'll do freaking ether rags. You'll think I'm one of those Brazilian teens that lives in the subway huffing paint by the end of this. I mean, I'll try anything. I'm desperate. Looks like I got freaking leprosy in my ankles. Anyway, we're on these uh, four million year old sands. Sandy clays, ancient sand dunes. So before this... Uh, Pinus palustris plantation was here. This was a rather diverse community of a bunch of different plants that were specifically adapted to this kind of fast draining, relatively nutrient poor sand. So anyway, you got the pine plantation, you got the road, and this little strip on the side is where the native plants are left to kind of do their thing. They don't get mowed over, they don't get sprayed, at least not yet. Same thing with the Midwest prairies. Those margins are the only place where the native plants can really, uh, you know, eke out a living once most of the land's been taken for agriculture. So anyway, let's check out some of the plants we got uh, growing right here, all right? Ariogonum tomentosum, all right? Look at this thing. And again, you can see that it's adapted to those uh, that harsh exposure, that full sun, that more arid microsite amongst a generally wetter and more mesic uh, uh, region, okay? You can see, look, look, it's got the, uh, all the hairs and shit that, look at that, it's got a thick, a thick velvet on the underside of that leaf. Hairs on a stem, hairs on everything. Look at that, look at that color of that hair, that russety orange on the adaxial side the top of the leaf, all right? And see, this one's getting ready to flower. It starts sending up uh, this uh, this stem and then it'll uh, it'll end up blooming, all right? Got another month or two left. You also got this Pityopsis species right here, which is an Asteraceae. See that, it looks like grass, it looks like a silver grass, but it's actually related to sunflowers. All right, there's five or six different species here. There's the old stem, the old flowering stem at the uh, Ariaganum, herbaceous perennial, dies back, but just then it sends out the new rosette uh, every year. Ariaganum, again, is another genus that's got most of its diversity in the arid west, but on these arid microsites, that's where you get uh, some of the buckwheat, some of the, the eastern Ariaganums. And then look at this thing down here, all right? Asclepius humistrata. This thing's incredible. Oh, it's, the flowers smell incredible too. And of course, it being a milkweed, it's an important host plant for the monarch butterflies and what they ship. And you got that waxy leaf with those pink veins. That thing's incredible, all right? But you take a, you take a picture of that, use it as a wallpaper on your phone, slob. You'll notice this shrub right here with the white flowers, all right? A member of the mint family, a relative of rosemary, Conradina glabra. Let's look at this one over here. This one's all lit up. And this thing loves the sand, okay? But it will grow in a garden uh, if you don't have full sand. So it's not, you know, it's not uh, it's not too picky. Look at those flowers, though. Three fused petals forming that lower lip. Two fused petals forming that hood. Look inside the flower. You got four stamens. You can see the anthers, the hissing up there. And you got that kind of bifid style, which is the female part of the flower, coming out, coming out the top. See that? Just above those four stamens, look, the Corolla's hairy on us too. Conradina has quite a few species in it in uh, northern Florida and central Florida as well. And look, that, that uh, calyx right there, those, those few sepals look like uh, typical of uh, calyxes in this family. See those ridges on them? That green calyx right there? Uh, and the whole thing smells like rosemary too. It smells incredible. You got those opposite leaves and uh, you can see on the underside of them, you got a little bit of a white indumentum. See that? Narrow leaves. The whole thing is built for full exposure on a relatively dry site. Again, those arid micro sites, okay? You're going to find a lot of cool plants that only grow on the sand, on the dunes. Just like you find with serpentine, just like you find with gypsum, just like you find with limestone. And then spreading by rhizome, as you can clearly see, we got Geobalanus from the order, from the family Chrysobalanaceae, order Malpighiales, same order as Euphorbia. Look, it's actually going to flower here. Doesn't get taller than this. They call it gopher apple, the common name. Glabrous leaves, red stem. This would be nice in a yard too. 
Something's got to be pounding those. I wonder what. Speaking of pounders, look at this juicy bastard. Look at this guy. Hitting the Conradina. Oh, nice carpenter bee. Get in there, guy. Get in there. Do your he's thing. Nectar, oh, he's nectar Oh, is he cutting it open? Yep. He's... Oh, you're slimy shit. I'm just kidding. You're fine. You're fine. You know? He's just cutting those leaves open, huh? Without providing pollination. Oh. Did he cut the leaves open? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he's he's taking a shortcut. Oh, he's a bad boy. Oh, there he goes. Now he's... Now he's doing there it. Is that go. so hard? Why don't you just do that the whole time? If you're going to just cut corners... This big ass. He's got that little black dot on his, uh, on his uh, dorsal, uh, the center of his dorsal part. I don't know the fucking name for that. I should know the name for that. His little bee legs. Oh, that's so cute. Look, a little fork. How many freaking stamens this Geobalanus has? You got the petals alternating with those uh, five sepals. The, the whole calyx resembling a little star. Almost never see this thing flowering. I just see it, uh, well, I guess it flowers now, but I didn't see it flowering yesterday when we seen it. What the shit is this? Look at that. That's a freaking U-form. Look how narrow those leaves are. That thing is just trying not to get, not trying to minimize its surface area, trying not to get hit by any sun. That is wild. God damn it. You gotta walk, you gotta walk the sandy shits. You walk the sandy shits, you could actually call it that. Put that next time you do a biological survey, if you work in that field. You know, tell your boss I'm gonna go walk the sandy shits. He'll understand, he'll know what you mean. All right, and then, then call him cockboy after the end of it. You know, just see what he says, just for shits and giggles. Maybe loosen him up. A lot of these people that work at biological surveying, they can be kind of stiff. You say, I'm gonna go walk the sandy shits, cockboy. You know, he'll probably maybe he'll chuckle. Yeah, there you go, yeah, Tragia urines. This is a Tragia, all right? But like many, or like all, almost all of you forms, it's got that three carpal ovary. That three carpal fruit. Oh, look at that style. That's beautiful. Look how it twirls around like that. Notice all those hairs on it, too. A lot of the tragedies are stingers. I don't feel anything after touching this guy yet. But who knows? Maybe those hairs are slowly uh, injecting me with some sort of uh, irritating or urticating substance. Anyway, uh, so you can see this little margin is where all this stuff grows, all right? Maybe one day there'll be actual preserves for this. I mean, I'm sure there are some here, but there's not many. Only crumbs were left. Most of it is that, and then, you know, that stuff gets harvested and sprayed, and it's just, it's too much disturbance for this stuff to really persist. But you get all these cool species popping up, and we only looked at a few of them. Imagine what was here prior to the pine plantation being here. Well, I think I've picked up a decent sampling of the chigger population from this area. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so here we go. Pinus palustris longleaf pine, a native stand of it. And this is a well-managed property. They actually burn it. Uh, relatively frequently on one to three year intervals to keep all the oaks down. You can see the oaks. If they didn't do that, the oaks would just take over and it would cease to be a savanna, it'd be a woodland. But look at this Baptisia lanceolata. All right, a member of the genus Baptisia, which is uh, quite species rich uh, on this uh, eastern part of the uh, United States up there. Get a couple of mid in uh, the Midwest as well. But look at those flowers. Banner wings and keel and uh, glabrous green leaves. Of course, that perennial root comes back from every year. Look at this nice tapestry of this Aristida, this bunch grass, Aristida stricta, and that geobalanus on the sandy soils. So well, tell us what you were just saying about the grass and it needs the fire and stuff. The whole, yeah. I mean, the whole landscape's fire dependent, but the grass, the Aristida especially is. Yeah, so in order to flower and, you know, seed, these Aristida, the wire grass, requires fire. And... It also is super important because it also carries fire through the ecosystem. So it's a critical component of these longleaf pine savannas. And when fire is suppressed, the aristida starts to die out because it's not able to reproduce. And then without the aristida, it's much harder to carry the fire through the landscape. And so it becomes even harder to burn. How many people live in nearby, uh, you think, know that the fire is, uh, you know, basically integral to the of, landscape? The organizations like the Nature Conservancy and the state parks have been doing a really good job at, at educating locals about prescribed burn because they see it happening all the time. You can't miss a prescribed burn if you live in the area. You definitely see it and you smell it and everybody needs to be educated about it and they're doing a pretty good job. Right, because we need that in the Midwest too. We need a prescribed burn. So the message definitely. here is Smokey the Bear's an asshole. Wait, did I see that? Ah, again, those salviaceous calyces. Clinopodium dentatum is this one. You got that bee fly going in there. Look, he's just sticking his whole head in there. Holy hell. What a what a cool plant. Clinopodium, of course. The only one I know is the one from California. 
Look at that, the yerba buena. Oh my god, I can smell it from here. It's so fragrant. Yucca filamentosa. Also, of course, you get a yucca on these arid sandy sites. See, the good thing about burning though, too, is the burning gets rid of all the trash and the filth. You know, all the shit. Like the ticks and the chiggers and stuff. Look at the quirk is with all the Talansius and the oides in it. And look at this, look at this monster longleaf cone. It's a rather large one. Biggest one I've seen yet. Look at this. So we're coming up on this bowl-shaped dip in the ground, all right? A steep head ravine, they call it down here. Lily's going to explain what it is, okay? What, so what's this? This is, a, this is a geologic feature, geographic feature of the area, right? And it's caused because these are ancient sand dudes. So there's a dense amount of sand, about 20, 30 feet of sand. And then it hits a limestone bedrock. So when the water percolates through the sand, when it rains, it hits that bedrock and then starts to seep out mid-slope in these ravines towards the Apalachicola River. And that creates the steep edge that has a bowl shape. And so they're called steep head ravines. So it'd be like instead of running a hose on a mound of sand, you stick the hose, you know, two feet down the sand and then stick it out at a 90 degree angle. And then it just starts. That's yeah, how it so would the, do it. Yeah, the top so of the ravine. So it's compromising the structural integrity halfway down. It's why you get it so steep like that, like a bowl nice. So it's like an 80 feet drop right there. And so we, oh Jesus Christ, I didn't yep. realize. So this yeah. creates a little micro habitat then too, huh? Yep. A nice cool, because it's cool water as well, so it's a nice cool little microhabitat that a lot of rare plants occur in. Jesus Christ, that is that is really steep. Yeah, it is. It's. I thought it. I thought it was more gentle. At the oaks, you got Quercus laurifolia, and then right here you got one of my favorites, Quercus geminata, with those. Uh, well, you can't really see them. A little bit, a little bit lighter of an underside. Look at that nice vein, mid yellow vein in the middle, and then that white uh, underside. Now, I think what's interesting for me is that a lot of people think of Florida and they think of the beach and all this stuff. They don't realize you got such a cool geologic feature going on in the north with all the, the sandy, basically the sandy arid microsites. Well, this isn't really a microsite. This is actually a pretty large dune system. There's that uh, Eupatorium capillifolium. Shit, I just I, was, I just was realized it sm smelled really nice suddenly, and I looked down at that clinopodium, that mint, the calamint. Smells incredible. I could smell it from here. Okay, tell me what you were just telling me. You get an ecotone on the edge of this steep yeah, head so ravine. Yeah, we have these upland sand hills, and then we have this ecotone that occurs between the slope forest and the ravines, which is like beech, magnolia, hardwoods, and the ecotone is where a lot of really cool plants occur. How many, do you think a lot of people don't know this is here? Like a lot of people. I think a lot of Floridians don't know this is here. They think, of, they think of that tacky fucking deranged version of paradise. They don't think of. I mean, it's these. a very narrow area of Florida that has this topography and geology. So it's, it's really unique. And that's why it's so rich in endemic species. And we'll head down a little bit because I want to show you this erythrina. If I could do it without breaking my ass. Look at that, erythrina herbacea. Which I've seen in Central Texas get about six feet tall, but here it's uh, popping out at about three feet, and of course you got a large corm down there. You got a large root, all right. But as you can see, it's clearly doing a whole hummer pollination thing. Look at those beautiful flowers. Very easy to grow from seed. There's the uh, fruits. So those are the bean pods, and they'll have those bright red, shiny seeds in, inside of them, about eight each, maybe more, uh, when they're ready in a few months. Super easy to grow from seed. You just gotta, you just gotta scratch it uh, near the hilum. You know, the little, uh, like well, like on a bean, they look like little red beans, they're toxic beans. The hilum's the the uh, little dot where it uh, connects to the rest of the plant, where the placenta is, you know? You know, you got all those, oh God, these flowers always blow my mind. We just gotta get a, let's just get a nice money shot of those flowers real quick. See that, look at that. Little Hummer sticks his beak in there, going for some nectar, and then just gets dusted with pollen up top. And of course the style uh, is in there too, along with those 10 stamens. Ten stamens, nine fused together, one free, sticking out of that very narrow, elongated tube. Erythrina herbacea, a lot of cool erythrina. Erythrina cristagalli is that big ass one from Brazil that forms a tree. It's basically like a giant living uh, hummingbird feeder. Look at that, you get the nice saw palmetto, nice serenoa repent. It's flowering actually. Let's see what's going on with the flowers on a serenoa. See who's hanging out. Look at that, three petals, looks like six stamens, covered in ants. Whole thing adapted to fire. And look at how, see how that petiole just ends in a flat uh, little truncate, like a chisel. All right, that's, that's a good diagnostic feature between this species, Serenora repens, and any of the uh, sable species, which that wouldn't be flat, that would end in a point. A little, a little green arrow, a little green spear. Okay, so you got a lot of oaks here, all right? So they do burn here, but they weren't for a while. So this is evidence of past fire suppression. But we don't like that because that's when the ticks start coming in. And that's when you think the oaks start getting too shady, 
for all the other cool sun loving stuff like that clinopodium that rare mint to uh hang on oh there was just a mosquito buried into my hand while i was filming that's nice yeah you get gopher tortoises here too gopherus polyphemus all right one of four species in a genus gopherus uh, occurring along a generally east-west latitudinal line in the southern part of the United States. So basically it was just a, it's an ancestral lineage that broke up and then speciated according to different climates and environments uh, according to what part of North America it was in. Then you get Mojave Desert Tortoise, Sonoran Desert Tortoise, Texas Tortoise, and then this one. Maybe there's one other one too. It is the most, do you see that? Do you see it? That's the most bizarre, that's crazy. Look at a scoloporus. Look at him just hanging out. Just blended in perfectly with a bark of this oak. You can't even see him. You see him over there? That happened to me with a species of frog in West Texas once. Blew my mind. You're so confident that nobody can see you. And you know what? You're, al you're almost correct. This Ariagonum, it's very weird to see one out east. Uh, because a genus that has so much diversity out west, you don't expect to see in these, uh, you know, on the eastern uh, eastern half of the 100th uh, meridian. You know, because it's just, there's just, a, it's a wetter area. This is the, the whole genus is more adapted to drier sites. But of course, on a dry microsite like this, you're gonna get one of the buckwheats, one of the Ariagonums. It's wild, and this is this is the landscape where it, uh, on these, on these sandy ass soils. Speaking of uh, plants that are adapted to dry soils, there you go, a prickly pear, a cactus, a Puntia mesicanta. And look at this, here we go. Another member of a generally full sun loving and more drought adapted genus, Dahlia. Dahlia pinnata. Look at that, that green foliage. Right? Like a like a like a darker minty green. It feels kind of waxy too. Ooh, and it smells pretty good. In a, in the uh Fabaceae, all right, and it's got that stinky foliage too, like all of tribe amorphia it does. Oh look, it's a mylar balloon. Who the fuck buys mylar balloon still? Jesus Christ. Fucking corny. Mylar Balloon Massacre, look at this. What a knob. Who gets one of these? They're just fucking tacky too. It's for a gender reveal. Maybe it was for a gender reveal. Look at this. This is nice, man. This is my kind of, this is where I would set up if I lived down here, you know? If I was looking for a place to camp, all right? There's probably so many goddamn chiggers, but that's why you burn. All right, I, I like this stuff. I like the exposed stuff. I think as humans, we have a, a predisposition towards these kind of grassland savanna habitats. That's what my guy Kyle Leiberger over at the Native Habitat Project's doing, right? He's he's trying to bring back fire, all right? Woodlands have just exploded because of Smokey the Bear the last few decades. And so he's trying to teach the importance of fire, the importance of managing lands for fire because it was part of this, this southeast ecosystem for so long. He also gets rid of all the bugs, all the ticks. All right, the woody encroachment, como se dice. So anyway, check that out, Nat Native Habitat Project. Really good guy. But this is what I like. I like these open exposed areas. You know, we don't, look at the Tratoscanthia, hiensis. Comolinaceae. Look at the cool monocot family. Look at the Diospros virginiana. The persimmon, ooh. Delicious fruit, but not here. Same to you, Quercus lavis and Quercus and cana. All the oaks. See, keep it down. I want to keep this open. I want to keep it exposed. This is why we burn. I want to get closer to uh, show you the plant right here, but we're going to have to do it from a distance because I don't want these guys crawling up my ankles and attacking my scrotum. My scrotum's already been attacked by ticks and chiggers in the last couple days. But this plant is a Florida endemic. From the pea family, you can see those triffid leaves. Remember, peas often have triffid leaves or pinnate leaves. This is Rhincosia cystoides, and there's the flower. You see the banner wings and keel. So, Faboidae subfamily, you know, as opposed to like, say, Salpinioidae or Mimosoidae, etc. You got that, uh, let's take a look. Oh, look at it. You can see scales on those leaves, too. Little white scales. And that banner petals. Look at the calyx, too. I thought it's a nice one. Christ. Not too, not too uh, imposing, right? Got the got glabrous uh, tops of the leaves, and then of course uh, a little bit a uh, little bit of pubescence on those undersides. I want to film this just for a second, just so you guys you know puke if you're eating a sandwich or something. Look, that's my chigger thing going on right now, just on the ankles. How about that? Oh, this is cool. Look at this one right here, diminutive little bastard. And there's some really big ones. There's 3,000 species in this genus, but there's only two native to Florida. This is in the loco weed genus, Astragalus. This is the Astragalus velosus. 
Look at that tiny little shit. Harry Kalis's kind of yellow cream colored flowers and there's those fruits maturing. Those little beans. Somewhat toxic secondary chemistry and it's what they call them the loco weeds. But uh, again, one of the largest genera of flowering plants that there is. I think there's something like 3,800 species. You know, we never get tired of getting money shots of a Puntia flower. See that? Look at the beetles in there. See those stamens moving around? They're, they're deep in there. Yeah, it's a plump little uh, prickly pear too. Filled up pretty good with the Risa rains. Well, we can wrap up there. So you see, when you got a diversity of topography and a uh, diversity of habitat, you have a diversity of species. All right, so thank God they're still burning here. All right, look at that, too. So much stuff you get down there, you're not going to get up here. But it is weird to see all these all these drier genera like the Ariagonum and Yucca, etc., growing, uh, growing here in North Florida. So anyway, that's all I got for you. That's all I got for you this afternoon. Have a good rest of your uh, evening, afternoon, whatever. Shit, go fuck yourself. Bye.